climate change is an existential threat to the planet. The global south are not the ones that have contributed most to climate change, but they are in the forefront of, of, of the ones who are going to suffer from it. Welcome back to BVTV. I'm Peter Fahlarsen, uh, the global editor of Reuters Breaking Views uh, in northwest London today, and just a few, a half a mile or so down the road, joined by Hugo Dixon, uh, the uh, commentator at large for Reuters. Welcome back, Hugo. Thank you, Peter. Lovely to be with you. Good to see you. So, um, so uh, Hugo, this week it's the it's the the annual meetings of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Lots of policymakers, finance ministers, bankers, etc., converging on Washington D.C. There's lots of them to talk about. They're going to be talking about the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, uh, rampant inflation, fears of recession, and so forth. But actually, you've written a column where you basically argue that they should be focused on, as well as all those things, they should be focused on the question of climate change and particularly how those those international institutions should get involved. Just sum up what your what your argument is. Yes, so I, I it's and, and to be fair, they are to some extent focused on this, but broadly speaking, um, climate change is an existential threat to the planet. The global south um, are the, the the emerging and developing economies are not the ones that have contributed most to climate change, but they are in the forefront of, of, of the ones who are going to suffer from it. But also, if they are not given a different development model from the one that the West chose and indeed the one that China chose, as Africa develops and India and other parts of Latin America, et cetera, et cetera, and populations are going back gangbusters, particularly in Africa, um, we will be way above the safe levels. I mean, I think we're going to be above the safe levels anyway of climate change, but way above them. And so we need a solution to that. Um, but what I'm arguing is that the rich countries, particularly the rich countries in the West, have got a strong self interest, enlightened self interest in helping mobilize trillions to help the global south go green fast. And this is not just because they will be hurt by climate change and the spillovers from climate change, such as mass migration, but there's also a very, very strong geopolitical need to do this. And that's because we've seen what happened with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and also China's um, saber rattling in Taiwan that the West actually needs allies elsewhere and helping them develop in a green way is one of the best ways to actually get those other countries more or less on side. Okay, so it's so 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 there's a win-win there for 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 the, for the rich countries. Um, but obviously it does require money. You you quote a number of a trillion dollars a year, uh, six times what they currently get that these countries need to decarbonize their economies, according to BlackRock. Um, obviously, we know that um, Western countries are all grappling with rising debt levels, interest rates are going up. Um, it's a kind of a tricky moment to be asking for those kinds of sums, isn't it? It is. It is. It is a very tricky moment to ask for those sums, but that's why you need to do a bit of um, imaginative finance. And I'm not proposing that much of that extra money comes from the rich countries' budgets directly. Uh, the big sum of money, the big source of the money is, of course, private sector capital. And we saw that initiative last year where Mark Carney, the former head of the Bank of England, corralled a lot of different financial institutions to say that they were committed to the net zero transition. They've got theoretically $130 trillion available, but very little of that is flowing to these countries in the global south, apart from China, very, very, very little. And so how, and that's partly because the, the returns or the perceived returns aren't nearly as high as the risks that they see. And so the question then is, um, how do you actually mobilize this giant pot of money? You don't need all of that 130 trillion, you only need one trillion a year. How do you, yeah. it's tiny, it's yeah. tiny, but how do you how do you mobilize it? And this, this is where actually the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks can play a crucial role. Yeah, and so it, it does seem like, I mean, there's sort of some momentum here because I think Janet Yellen, I believe the US Treasury Secretary was was, 
calling on the World Bank to do more in this respect. And, and so it does seem like there's, there's a certain push going on, but, but just sort of, just, just square, to explain a bit more, how, how do you sort of get that money uh, and what can the, can the World Bank and the IMF do to, 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 to get that money productively into, um, into these countries? And, and what kind of things are we talking about when, when the money's being put to work? Okay, so I, I'm really focused much more on the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks like the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the EBRD, et cetera, et cetera, rather than the IMF, which does have a role, but let's not go there for the moment. Or, or And um, essentially, they can, first of all, um, and the G20 commissioned a report that showed this, that they can actually do more with their own balance sheets without um, losing their very high credit ratings. And this G20 report said that they could perhaps invest several hundred billion dollars. Okay, that doesn't get you what you need, but that's the sort of, that's the beginning. And that's the, the thing that Janet Yellen and other um, shareholders are backing this week. The second thing that they can do is that, and I think this is important, is that those institutions that actually show they're ambitious and they've got credible plans that then actually the shareholders should put more money into them. And that's quite a small institution, but very focused called the Climate Investment Funds, um, which the Americans actually did put a billion into um, last week. And they're very focused on things like coal transition, which is um, what they're doing is they're helping countries retire early their old coal plants so they need you need to pay them to do that. And then you also to compensate maybe some of the owners, et cetera. But you also need to compensate the workers and retrain the workers. So there's a sort of, this is what's called the just transition aspect mm -hmm. of it. So there's that. And then there's a lot that can be done also with guarantees. So one of the critiques of the World Bank and other of these institutions is that they actually haven't, they haven't pulled in private sector capital, they've often crowded it out. They've gone for the lo low hanging fruit. And then, you know, maybe there are some very risk, uh, you know, some, some private equity funds or something which will go in, but the general mass of pension funds, et cetera, won't go in uh, unless they've got something that's closer to a plain vanilla investment. And so one of the ideas is instead of crowding out, they should crowd in. And if guarantees were used like credit, you know, guarantees to enhance the credit of a say a portfolio of loans. This has already been tried um, by the African Development Bank, but on a small scale about it, just over a billion dollars. Mm. Um, but that could then by definition, if you guarantee some investments by um, private um, investors, you're actually crowding them in. And that can be done not just by these multilateral development banks, that can be done by their shareholders. I mean, you know, the US, Britain, sure. Germany, et cetera, they can, they can, I mean, of course, this has a cost. It's an off-balance sheet cost, but it's nothing, nothing, I mean, of course, there are huge off-balance sheet risks if we don't deal with climate right. change. Yeah. No, well, and that's, that is, the, that is the key point, which uh, um, uh, hopefully will, uh, will, will sort of sink in in, in Washington DC this week. And as you say, it's only a few trillions here and there. So, you know, how hard can it be? But uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's see where we can go. Hugo, good as always to talk to you and uh, uh, speak to you again soon.